Hi everybody, it's really nice to see you here. I know there's several friends here and it's great to be here live for the first time in 20 years with people. Mm -hmm. It's just it's wonderful to see you. <laughs> um, so this presentation is called Tuning Into Your Spine or The Spine or something and uh, it'll be about many other things I'm sure but um, uh, this is presented by the London Cello Society and uh, supported by my Luthier. Um, so thank you to both of those. Um, I thought we'd start just by giving um, a quick introduction, both of us, to who we are and what we do. Sure. And then uh, Pete and I decided that because it's live and we haven't had much live recently, we're just going to have a conversation and see where that goes. So I hope that's okay with you. Um, uh, so I'll start just by saying a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Ruth Phillips and I'm a cellist, as you can see. Um, I run Breathing Bow, we're, we're the birth books team, by the way, you can't see <coughs> that probably. Um, I run workshops uh, for string players called the Breathing Bow, working with breath and mindfulness um, and just particularly interest, interested since I started having yoga lessons with Pete how many years ago? 30 years ago probably. At least. Yes, it must be that. Yeah. Um, uh, really was a catalyst of becoming fascinated with uh, the fact that we are basically movers and uh, just like athletes and, and this seems to be an area where, where people are more and more interested and I'm really fascinated by that. So I run The Breathing Bow and I work with um, an organisation called Inside Out Musician and I mention that because also I'm very interested in how we go from the inside outwards um, and how without losing our sense of ourselves and being present and uh, I'm also uh, training to be a mindfulness teacher with Tara Brach and Jack Cornfield so that's me and over to you Pete. Very nice. I'm Pete Blackaby, um, yoga teacher and osteopath although I'm more yoga teacher and less osteopath these days and I, I guess my my interest has been evolving over the years and um, I mean, Ruth said that we met 30 years ago. We're probably quite a different kind of yoga than to the one I'm teaching now. Yeah. You've been coming to Zoom classes, so you probably yeah. recognise that. And my, my interest has been much more over the last few years, on the last 10 years probably, on uh, how we interfere with movement and breathing. Uh, and what are the issues that make us uncomfortable in the world. What I've kind of enjoyed and what keeps me interested in this is that it's an ever growing topic you know it's, it's, it's um, there's no bottom to to the inquiry one of the things you notice or what I used to feel very much is the problems of the body were of the body and problems of the mind were of the mind and now I just don't see any division between the two they seem so intertwined which again is fascinating I, I guess you know one of the things I've been learning a lot about is how we become uncomfortable in the world, in our bodies or, or in our behaviour, in our lives, and what kind of systems we have within us to help prevent that happening, and whether we pay attention to that or not seems to be important. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to uncover here, with Ruth, <laughs> because I'm not a musician, although I, I have very recently started trying to learn the guitar. So I'm, I'm just learning chords, and I'm, I'm realising how tense you can be doing that. So well, I'm sure there'll be plenty to discover as we, as we go into this. Yeah. 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 So yeah, one of the, the things that I've been looking at a lot and particularly inspired by working with Pete, um, and Pete, you said something in the class the other day, mm. we've been doing classes with Pete on Zoom. Thank God for Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been um, And one of the things you said the other day, actually, which really fascinated me was that when we're born, um, mm. that the lumbar spine is actually in flexion. Yeah. And I find that really interesting because the journey between the going towards this performance body mm. that we tend to have, which where we overarch the lumbar spine and push the breastbone forward, um, mm. is, is very hard for musicians to get to soften back and actually let that... Um, I was I had a hernia, a double hernia, a year yeah. ago, and it oh, here, yeah. and I was told that I needed to learn to slump, nice. and that is really yeah. something that you work a lot with, isn't yes, it? Slumping yeah. and allowing 
such a bad word, isn't it? Yeah. And just allowing yeah. that to, and so I'm interested in ha what you feel about this kind yeah. of going forward into space and performance and allowing oneself yeah. to, do you want to say something about well, that? Well, it's, uh, it's a good question. And, um, you know, the, the whole thing around presentation is something I talk quite a lot about in yoga. And I don't really mean here necessarily, you know, music presentation, but the idea that we present ourselves to each other, you know, in, in, in ways that we don't fully realise we're doing. And it, it's slightly uncultured. I mean, most of us at some point have been taught to sit up straight or stand up straight. Yeah. Or, and we've been taught that slouching is bad and only slovenly people do it. Mm. But the, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, to, to sit up straight requires a lot of muscular effort. <laughs> and the reason we slouch is because it doesn't. You know, the way, way we're set up as anatomically as bipeds is that we have a, a fantastic amount of tissue on the back of our body, connective tissue, that supports us if I slump. So if, I, if I'm slumping like this, I, I really hardly use any muscles at all. It's all done and supported by tracts of connective tissue that, that, that run along my spine. And, but if I sit up straight, you know, it's all muscular. Mm. So it's very tiring, very exhausting. And if that becomes habituated because you feel this is where we should be in the world, and I think things like, you know, dance, the military, and in yoga, Iyengar yoga, you know, have all emphasised the lift the breastbone kind of attitude. And there's, it's been um, valued, you know, mm. in, in, a, in a way. And we've lost the the fact that human beings are actually more comfortable in flexion than they are in extension. So, you know, to when people sigh into a chair at the end of the day, they slump <laughs> because, because it's comfortable. Mm. Uh, and of course there are times of activity when we're excited and we're, we're lively and we, we, we might be in that kind of presentation state. But if you hold it too long, it's exhausting. Well, one of the things about that is also when I think when we go into that... Um, projecting forward mode um, as musicians anyway I think we actually lose our connection to ourselves we lose our inner listening in fact mm. I, I mean that I find that very it, when mm. I feel that in my body when I because I, I've now become very aware of just the minutest mm. movement into that my, nobody would even see it but mm. I can now having worked with you I can really feel that just tiny movement in particularly my lumbar spine but also opening up here and that I stop listening inwards and, and yeah. I start projecting outwards. And that balance is so interesting in the body. Not to, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And obviously you do. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, I mean, there's a tension here, isn't there? Because, you know, I know in my fledging guitar playing it, it, that if I'm trying to learn how to play a chord, you know, wrap my fingers around a fretboard, I can be stopping breathing, I can tighten my jaw. Because when you're thinking, it's very hard to feel, and that's something that a lot of people have observed, that, that the thinking state of mind takes us away from the sensory feeling state of body. Would you also say that if you're thinking that you can't listen, that's something... Well, that's what I mean, yeah, you can't sense, you can't feel, you can't notice. It's why you can be at a computer for an hour and not really notice you've got mm. completely stiff until you finish, and then go, mm. you know, crack I never realised how mm. tense I was. The converse is also true. It's very difficult to be immersed in sensory experience and to be able to think. Mm. So I, I think there's there's a slight tension between when you're learning a piece, I imagine, I mean, you can probably fill me on this more, but in, in, in my kind of understanding of all what I'm, where I am, and a brief period of my life where I played cricket, which is a, yeah. a thing where you, you have to... If you overthink it, you, you can't play. Mm. You know, I imagine if you overthink playing a cello or any musical instrument, you, you can't play. So there's a tension between the point when you're learning something and you have to be thinking about it, you know, as you're learning a new piece. You probably are going to be getting more tense. But once it's learned, it's really important that you can drop back into your body. And I think that's the... You know, the, the, the skill, I think, is to learn... To do anything with as minimal tension as possible so mm. the more complicated it gets the harder that is to do but that's got to be part of the process if you if you're learning a new piece on a guitar or a cello or any musical instrument 
and you're doing it while you're holding the breath or tensing your jaw or holding your back or lifting your breastbone, what you're doing is mapping the muscular movement that you're making, whatever it is, mm. with the tension you're bringing to it. They get mapped together yeah, as an experience. Yeah, yeah. And then when you play it, you repeat it. Yeah. So you're, you know, what I'm, what I'm learning in my guitar playing is that when I first played the C chord, I was <laughs> trying to wrap my fingers up. Yeah. But then the second time and the third time, my job was to relax my body and relax my body so I could eventually bring my hand in yeah. the right position I could be quiet. I suppose the question is, wherever you are, what can you relax? What can you let yeah, go of? Yeah, always. I remember work, yeah. doing something where, I think it was with you, where we, we paused at the top of the breath. Yeah. And mm. you were speaking about, and I, I found this a lot with it, for example, if I'm in a difficult position, high position or thumb position on the cello, you, you actually asked, what can you relax? And in fact, the only thing that you were holding was the glottis. Yeah. The rest of us, the shoulder, everything else mm. could actually relax. Although we were, we habitually would do that when we yeah. hold. We're at the top. So if I'm at the top of the cello, or if I'm, yeah. at, this is a position that for cellists is really, we're yeah. at the, on the A string at the yeah. end of the bow. So yeah. I suppose the question would be what, and I'm happy for you to come and well, uh, explore yeah, yeah. that, what can, I, what can I relax there? So of course... I mean the, the question is yours in a way and what I would be asking, what I'd be interested in you exploring is saying well what do I have to do to, to, to bow? You know? yeah. what, what, what part of this is, is important you know, or essential for bowing? Yeah. Yeah. And to be constantly asking them what isn't essential. So can I relax my? Yeah. Can I drop more into my sitting bones? Yeah. Can I relax my elbow more? Can my jaw relax more? Can you, that'd be the question that I'd be yeah. be asking you. And I, I, you know, I would ask back. You see, one of the questions that I'd be interested in uh, would be, you know, if you are performing, and when I when we when I teach yoga, I'm constantly saying it's not a performance, it's mm, not a performance, yeah. we're, we're not performing in yoga, so I, I'm, my whole drive, my whole interest is to notice any performative act that people are bringing to it, can they do this pose, can yeah. they, you know, which is what I would call performative, but it's a question for you, I guess, to ask yourself, how much do you, to be able to play, to be in yeah. front of an audience, to, you know, to, to become excited by the movement, yeah. how much do you need to be excited in your body or is it possible to be and I, I suspect it could be to be really quiet in your body and still deliver a yeah it's i think it's incredibly important yeah. and i think it's something that we don't practice yeah we don't actually i mean one of the things i work with a lot is is how do we um if i'm um ending <laughs> coming to rest can I really come to rest mm. at the end of a note yeah and uh, mostly we don't we don't actually allow that complete well, rest exactly what you yeah, is watching so, your elbow yeah, yeah. The, the so, dropping of the elbow yeah. quiet so that is a very quiet place and mm. it's completely mm. regenerative yeah and if I can't regenerate then I'm going to get into more and more stress yeah and I think when you to go back to your question about performance um, I think that there's a for me there's a basic rule of if we're not listening inwards and we're not nourishing ourselves regenerating ourselves mm. re-energizing ourselves resting breathing out mm. if i'm not doing it mm. then there's no way my audience can connect to it i agree so i'm if i'm performing am i only just breathing in mm. and pushing out mm. or am i actually if i can actually do have that relationship then then it's possible to relate to that I think. Yeah I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, you know when you see performers where you become kind of entranced but they're often you feel they're lost in their music somewhere there is they're, they're just embodying the whole thing mm. and tension always interferes with that yeah. so when you see people with tight necks and tight jaws yeah. and tight shoulders yeah. Even this probably, yeah, that, sure. I mean, I know yeah, that sure. I spent years mm -hmm. playing with this yeah. attitude yeah. and it's not comfortable to watch if you're my audience. No. I, you don't feel comfortable. No. Like, you don't feel comfortable swallow. being around people like that. Yeah. It is, um, again, something I sometimes you know, talk about. That if, you're, if you're at a party in a social event and you don't know anyone, mm. the person is standing there like this with a you know, the, the smile and chest raised mm. and the shoulders back they're not the people I'm drawn to because mm. I don't kind of know what's going on. 
you yeah, know. you can't relate to them. No, you can't. Yeah. The person might be a little bit slumped and, you know, mm. a bit thoughtful and relaxed in their body, but might look a bit miserable. Like, you know exactly what's going on, so you can relate. You yeah. You just put your arm around them and go, you're all right, you know, because yeah. Yeah. you know that they're reflecting how they're feeling. So I think the the tendency for us to try and perform for each other is always a mistake, mm. you know, to to fully embody how you feel inside, but we a little bit caffeine, of course, it is always the thing we're aspiring to. If, see, anxiety and worry are, are rooted either in the past or the future, aren't they? You know, if you're anxious or worried about anything, yeah. you're remembering something that happened, or you're projecting something into the future about what you think might happen. Mm. And, and the only escape from that is the present, you know, and how do you become in the present? What do you, you notice what you're feeling in the moment? Mm. And I think that's the kind of place I would be asking people to go to. We have techniques that we can employ, you know, slow, quiet breathing. Um, this is what I call top down processing. You yeah. know, the, <coughs> if, if you're starting to feel you're spinning out of control, your emotions have got the better of you, slowing your breathing down, resting in a chair supporting your body weight you know all those kind of things will be helpful but actually ultimately we should be more interested in um, not carrying our history around with us you know which is how we often live our lives and if we carry our history around with us we tend to repeat the same features because we're not really in the present and the way we you know, in yoga, the way I think about this is how history being represented in my body is tension. Stuff I'm holding, I don't realise I'm holding. I've been mm. holding it all the time, you know. Mm. This is what I did yesterday, so I did the day before and the day before because I don't notice it. You start learning how to quieten that. You start to feel different. And then you have some more choice about how you're going to be. Mm. You know, and it's a, you know, there's no easy solution to how you bring people to that place. But asking people to find support is really essential. And in, in the body, the way we look for support is through the skeleton. So, you know, you know, I'm always talking down, downward dog, how, how can you rest through the arms? Mm. Or, and we would have the same, just to yeah. bring it back to the cello, how do we rest on the string? You know, yeah. How do we let... Okay. Yeah. Like we, we will always talk about, you know, be, becoming grounded and let mm. the earth hold you and mm. connect it through your feet. But actually, also, we have to be allow the string to hold our bow like yeah. like the earth holds yeah. our body and yeah. if we're in any way holding our weight back and then pushing yeah. then that will be the same the, the equivalent i think yeah. of that kind well, of I mean, resting it, into the instrument and, sure and if that also there's the resting there's the resting out of the instrument yeah. as well so that's that will take the weight out but i'm resting here in my elbow for example yeah so, you, you, letting it relax down yeah. i mean the other the other thing i've done in the past is been a carpenter, you know. I don't know if you know. Yes, that. I do. <laughs> the first 15 yeah. years of my sort of post school life was carpentry. And I mean, there you're always using the weight of a saw. You, know, mm. if you don't push with a saw, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you use the weight of the saw to do the work. Yeah. And you keep your shoulders relaxed, otherwise, you're constantly getting yeah, repetitive yeah. stress. Yeah. And if you, the more you tighten up a, a rounded joint, if you. It's something to think about that the more relaxed the body is, the more forces travel through a body. Mm. And that's what they should be. You know, so the skeleton is the part of our anatomy that transmits forces. So you know, muscles generate forces. We lift our arms and we move around mm. with, with our muscles. But bones transmit forces. And when you're making any kind of movement, whether you're reaching up or whether you're turning around or yeah. bending down towards the floor, the force the muscles create should travel through your skeleton and should be distributed as fully through the, all the joints of your body as, as possible. Yeah. You, know, you know, I've talked about compliance and yoga. Yeah. Compliance being you know, your whole body participating in what you're doing, not just your shoulder moving. So, yeah, so actually, yeah. having said that, can I just yeah. talk about something which is, I'm really interested in this, um, this particular movement and going back to the spine because. Mm you know, this whole thing that we have to sit straight, yeah. right? So if I'm moving over here and I actually mm. really need my arm to be over here mm. or I need, 
Mm. So I can allow my spine to 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 Turn. carry that movement. Yeah, yeah. Um, For sure. So there, there's a lovely exercise that uh, the cellist Steve Doan does, where you 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 uh, it's all he calls it the owl movement. <laughs> Right. So he actually, but he also leads with his eyes. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. You've spoken sometimes about leading with the eyes, and yeah. I've been thinking when I've been swimming, as well, um, about leading the turn of the body with the eyes. And I'm really interested in what you think about where does the movement initiate. So if I'm really doing a big string crossing, mm. and I've, I'm trying to do it without with a completely rigid spine, that is not gonna. I'm not gonna have any any weight or any mm. vitality in my arm at all. Mm. But where does the movement originate, yeah. do you think? In the brain. In the brain. <laughs> okay. it's, it's the easy answer. Because uh, um, it's often a question you get asked this, and I, I puzzled over it for a long time until I kind of started to really understand it. You know, if, if, you're, if you're making a movement like turning, well, where does it start? Mm. With, it's, it doesn't really work like that. What, what happens is when you've practiced a movement, Whatever it could be, anything you know, um, playing the cello, you know, so you, you're bowing, whatever it is you're doing. Um, once you've created the intention of what what it is you're going to do, or reach and pick up a glass, mm. what will happen in the brain is that the neurons in the sensory motor cortex will organise themselves to fire to organise that movement. So there will be a a flood of downward neurological outflow from from the brain to all the muscles of your body at the same time to evoke the pattern of movement required for whatever it is that you do. An interesting neurologist called Michael Graziania wrote a book in about 2005, I think, called The Intelligent Movement Machine. And he was one of the first neurologists to fully understand that the sensory motor cortex is mapped in movement repertoires and he did a lot of work on monkeys to understand this and their movements are ambulatory or feeding or scratching or copulating or whatever, whatever it is but these are you know these are rehearsed movements that are you know you can you can trigger all these repertoires of movement by stimulating a few points in the brain you know if you stimulate a motor neuron in the brain they used to think that the what would happen was that there would be uh, that motor neuron would send a signal down the nerve fibre and make a muscle twitch. That, that was the old school thinking up until about 2005. But what they now realised is that if you stimulate a motor neuron, what that motor neuron does before it sends any message down is it talks to other motor neurons, in a sense trying to find out what we're doing. Right. So motor neurons in the brain organise themselves to fire, to carry out movement repertoires, the things we've rehearsed to do in life. Mm. And what you want to do when you're practicing any kind of movement is learn to rehearse them in ways that the map you have in your brain is the most efficient map you could possibly mm -hmm. have. So that when you come to play it, you haven't got all this extraneous stuff going on. So if there's any, on any level that you've, you've been told that you have to sit up straight and yeah, you're going to so inhibit so. any yeah. kind of yeah. turning yeah. movement of the free spine, then and that will stop that. Yeah. process presumably yeah and more likely lead to injury if you think about it if you if you've been told to sit up straight you fix your body your body becomes stiff and all the movements will come from the arm the shoulder mm. and the wrist mm. they will work much harder than if you know that joint will be doing more work than if my ribs and my spine yeah. are doing yeah. some of the work yeah. too so you you always want to distribute movement as much as you can through a body um as much as i, I guess the the task you're doing allows, you know, you, you, and that's as, as a musician, I guess, would be the thing you'd have to figure out. I mean, I'm learning playing chords in the guitar. I'm still just learning how to move from one chord to another and only do that, you mm. know, without frowning and, yeah. you know, even those kind of things, frowning, hold, tightening the jaw, um, they'll all get mapped into the movement. Yeah. Moish Feldenkrais said a, a really interesting thing many years ago. He said, how many people have got perfect handwriting? And it's a good question, isn't it? Because we all love to write, mm. and, and very few of us have. And his point there was most of us learn to do whatever tasks we learn to do well enough to 
to carry out its function. So as long as people can read your writing and you can write at a reasonable speed, that's good enough. And the only people who will ever perfect their writing are calligraphers or people who are doing italics or something like that. But you, you can apply that to everything you do. So, you know, if you're, if you're playing cricket, you know, you can learn to bat or bowl or field with as much efficiency as possible. You can learn to do it as skillfully as you can. And that means learn the movement as well as you can and drop away any extraneous movements. Make sure you're not holding the breath, tightening your jaw, tensing anything that doesn't need to be tensed. And that's a real practice. I mean, you know, in yoga, that's what we do a lot. Mm. You know, I, I often start us off lying down in Shavasana doing nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I think on occasions I've said, you, you've, you've almost got to try and take Shavasana into every movement. Mm. How relaxed can you be mm. and still carry out the function mm. you need to do? Actually, to take you up on the handwriting thing, mm. because I'm, I'm also very interested in this balance between um, local and global attention. Okay, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and we did an exercise actually of doing a course with, I don't know if you've heard of Jennifer Johnson, she's a body mapping and we talk about mapping a lot mm. so yeah, yeah it's really interesting work mm. and she did this exercise which made me think a lot about something which I'll tell you in a minute. Mm. We did an exercise where we had to write our signature only focusing on the nib of our pen. Okay. And then mm. gradually make the next yeah. step was to do it with our attention on the four corners of the page, yeah. just our 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 mm. awareness. Yeah. And then to add into our awareness, still you know, still with our eye on the pen if you yeah. like, but yeah, adding into our awareness two colours in the room and then the next step, I think it was some space above one. Yeah. And I found when I had my attention only on the nib of the mm. pen, I couldn't write fast. Right. And yeah. I, yeah. that just something really clicked for me is that that's why I couldn't play fast. Right. Because I had no uh, larger awareness of the yeah. bigger gesture, of the bigger movement yeah. of... And that was really interesting, and 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 so, for example, if I'm if I'm bowing, I will give attention to my feet. I'll give attention to. I might well even just give specific attention to my big toe at some point, sure. or I might give attention to my mm. thumb, or my uh, certainly my shoulder, mm. or uh, um, many many things. Yeah. But we, as you, I think mm. you've said, basically we always have to come back yeah. to how the whole thing is integrated, and if we miss that step. Yeah. If we stay in the local attention, yeah. something is never going to yeah. really flow, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the, the man who's written some really fascinating stuff on this is Ian McGilchrist. Did you come across him? No, I haven't. He, he's a, he written a book called The Master and His Emissary. It, it's a fascinating, it's a, it's a huge tome. And it, I, I got the audio version of it, so just the writing yeah. is more than famous. But he's done a lot of work on, he's a psychologist of yeah, he's a psychologist, I think. He's done a, an awful lot of work on split brain patients, people who have had the corpus callosum, the, mm. uh, the neurons that, that join the left and right hemispheres of your brain up, people who have had them severed. And the surprising number of people who have had them severed because it used to be a treatment for epilepsy before better epileptic drugs were, were, were invented. It's surprisingly successful. You know, one of the things that's really surprising about it and you know, almost amusing, is that you would think that if you severed the the conversation between the left and right hand of the brain, it would be pretty catastrophic. I, I mean, I would just kind of think that, but apparently it's not really. In fact, for a while, you, you hardly notice anything's changed. But then you see odd behaviours, and, and you know, he describes one of the behaviours is that, you know, the left hand might go to pay for some food and the right hand may steal it out of the left hand <laughs> and put it back in the pocket. You know, really, like, you've got two different people living yeah. inside your head. And people with left or right hemisphere strokes will sometimes, I can't remember the name of the condition now, but, you know, will ignore one half of everything. They're not, the one half of their body, they'll only eat food off one half of a plate. If you ask them to draw a clock, they'll only draw one half of the mm. clock. They'll absolutely not really see one half of of the world, they'll ignore mm. one half of the world, and they'll make up all kinds of elaborate excuses to say why they're doing that. But the, 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 the thing he, he discovered about the left and the right side of the brain, and this isn't the kind of pop psychology version of, you know, I don't know, the left side of the brain is artistic yeah. and, and the, the, the right side is mathematical. He, 
he didn't he didn't observe that at all. He noticed that what uh, I think it's the um, I, I may have juxtaposed these two, um, but I think the right side of the brain is um, all about global attention, global awareness. Mm. It, it's very interested in the big picture, and the left side of the brain is the detailed, you know, um, looking at little bits of things and is much more interested in, in mechanical things and man-made things mm, apparently mm -hmm. you know the, that side of our brain is much more alert to those aspects of our, our being and he he noticed that birds for example will look at food with one eye you know and again i think it's the um sort of details side so the left brain would be the right eye They'll be looking at the food of the right eye and pecking with that, and the other eye will be looking to see if it's predators. You know, yeah, they, yeah. they really divide attention like that. And it seems that there are times when we have to have very focused attention in life and, and be able to focus without worrying about the big picture. And the, the, of course, the rest of the time, we need the big picture. We need mm. to know how we fit into the world and, uh, and our, you know, our environment. So I think in terms of things like playing, what I'm noticing and in almost any skill that you're learning, um, there is this period where you are very detailed, very looking at parts of yourself and trying to figure out how you do parts. And in yoga, as you say, we might concentrate a lot on how you settle your feet into the floor. But in the end, it's got to be integrated into the whole. And not just into the whole, but the whole in its environment. That's really interesting because I, I I'm not sure I entirely agree that that's a very healthy way around for us musicians. Okay. I think that's the way we learn. We learn from the detail yeah. backwards. Yeah. And I'm finding that, and I suppose this is where the breath has come in for me, mm -hmm. where the breath, the shape of the breath has, has been a real teacher, is that um, mm. learning from just flipping it completely on its mm. head and starting with the gesture, this is going back to this handwriting thing, yeah. starting with the bigger gesture and yeah. then refining it. Yeah. Um, so if I'm starting with a basic sense of release mm. with my arm like that, mm. with both sides of my body, so mm. I'm not like frantically vibratoing on one yeah, side yeah. and then releasing with it. So that's a very central, centrally governed, even though the details of what I'm doing on each side are very mm. different, mm. the basic movement, the basic yeah. gesture is either in release or in, mm. in um, building tension or releasing tension. Okay. So then I can, I can then move into refining the movement which means I could mm. you know go to my fingers oh mm. that was a bit sharp for example mm. with intonation is a good example mm. instead of going to the finger to correct intonation mm. finding the gesture first finding yeah. the bit and then saying okay yeah, so the, sure. that finger needed sure. to be so that's quite interesting in the way we learn an instrument I feel that because we get stuck in that local attention yeah, okay. and it's very hard to go back for sure. to the global attention from that place it's just a i mean i'm, I'm very i'm just interested in this no uh, this i think question. i think that's well observed in a way and i often play around with this in my mind when i'm teaching yoga you know as i say sometimes i might start with the kind of global feeling of being relaxed yeah, lying yeah, on the yeah. floor and doing nothing and, and i'll try very hard you may have been in the classes when i've said you know Try to remember how it feels to be in a body relaxed doing nothing. And then you may come onto all fours and try and recover that feeling. You're on all fours, there's yeah. something you're doing, you're still trying to recover that feeling. Yeah. And then you may go into down a dog and you're still actually most interested in recovering the feeling. You're not worrying about details. You're, you're interested in can I go from lying on my back onto all fours into down a dog with my prime objective to recover remain in that feeling of feeling quiet, easy, comfortable mm. in yourself. Mm. And your job is then to notice anything that interferes with that. Mm. You know? mm. Exactly. Yeah. So you could be saying the same sort of thing. Yeah, I you would say, say you start with this. I, so I start, let's, we mm. have a musical gesture. And I'll mm. make the gesture. And then, um, mm. let's see if I can... So uh, if I've got um, Saraband, I'll, I'll practice it like this. Mm. Uh, mm. Just try and find that basic movement. So I will, I will use my breath mm. to, to to learn that expansion, mm. and then I will then allow the breath just to be natural. But mm. the breath will help me find that 
uh, yeah. Thing. And then I can add the chords and I can add the the small the notes, but I don't. And as soon as I lose that feeling yeah. of the basic yeah. expansion and release, as soon as it, like you're saying, as soon as it stops, I go back. To yeah. The, to the simple gesture to find it again. Is that yeah. a similar thing to what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. I, I mean, um, for sure, in the sense that to be alert to when you become uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is the essential thing. When people have to, you know, so I could imagine if, if people are nervous about playing in front of an audience, maybe there's a, you know, there's a, there's a general sense of anticipation of doing something which is quite human. But if you're, what you're interested in is what is it you've done or thought of when you start to feel anxious or worried, or it's no yeah. longer just the excitement or the anticipation of doing something, it becomes something that's an impediment to, to yeah. the thing you're trying to do. And you're, you're trying to notice, well, what did I do then? What thought went through my mind? Yeah. What did I anticipate? What did I remember? Uh, instead of saying, well, how do I feel? How right. do I feel now? Right. You know? right. And that's always the question is, trying to carry that feeling of feeling well in yourself um, and not letting it get knocked off course by something you've remembered, something you've done. You know, we sometimes do head balance, don't we? Or, or we, we don't do head balance, we, <laughs> we, we, do, we prepare for prepare it. For it. One of the reasons I like preparing for head balance is because of all the anticipation that people bring to it, yeah. all the worries and anxieties. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm trying to persuade people to do is to, so you start here and you go, how do you feel? And you go, well, I'm all right. Yeah. How do you feel now? Yeah, yeah. And how do you? F and you keep asking yourself the question. And what you're interested in is the moment that something upsets your equilibrium, mm -hmm. and that because that's the interesting thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not. There's no technique about how you get into a head balance. You, you know, the, you put your hands in a certain place. And you put your, the thing that makes it difficult is all the stuff you bring to it, mm -hmm. all the unnecessary yeah. stuff you bring to it. Yeah. So. You know, and I imagine it's very similar with yeah, exactly. playing So music. it does take, it really does, it's funny because, you know, as musicians we're told to practice slowly, but it's been kind of meaningless, really, you know, practice, slow it down. But oh, yeah. sometimes it actually means yeah. speeding up the gest mm. speeding up the music to find the, the bigger mm. gesture, mm. which is a way of kind of slowing it down, mm. or slowing it down so much that that you that you're literally going frame by frame like you say yeah. to say okay so when do i stop feeling uncomfortable yeah. when have i stopped breathing yeah. when have i lost yeah. contact with my spine yeah. or my sit bones and yeah so those kinds of things you know these these random things that we learn to do practicing slowly you know yeah what does that I, I, mean really precisely you know, and I, you know i had a, a little bit of a rant a few months ago about someone who said they liked my yoga because it was so slow and so if you think Is that that's me? The, no. <laughs> it might have been. No, no, it wasn't you. But I sort of think you missed the point. You know, the only point about going slow is nothing wonderful about going slow. You can go really slowly and stupidly. You know, you can yeah. do stupid yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So the, the only point about going slowly is you go slowly enough that you notice when things change to your detriment. Yeah, that, that's the only reason you slow things down. So you have more time to notice the kind of habitual things you're likely to bring in because they go in so quickly. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And you're, you, you're interested in when did I bring that holding of the breath in? When did I bring that stiffening of my shoulders? And when did I grip my toes? You know? yeah, yeah. And you need to slow it down enough. And sometimes you have to do it really, really, really yeah. slowly. Yeah, you know, yeah, before yeah. people go, oh, I did it even before I thought about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a bit like that thing about the yeah. hollowing out the spine and even just thinking about yeah. Sitting down to play mm. for another person, you can feel the beginning of the movement. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're they're just yeah. checking and going back yeah. and mm. slowing down. But yeah. that's a, a good practice, anyway, isn't it? Just rocking backwards and forwards mm. and noticing how you feel in extension, how you feel mm. in flexion, how you move from one to the other. And at the time when your <coughs> your body will have the greatest resonance, the the greatest freedom is when you there's when you're in the middle of these things, when you're well supported mm. by your bones. And would you say, I mean? It's interesting because we, again, we're, with good, this whole idea of good posture mm. and the, the bad press that slumping has, mm -hmm. for me, this, actually that has been incredibly, learning, to, allowing myself to mm. do that when I play, when I mm. rest, when I come to rest, has been so yeah. important, but it goes, yeah. so it goes, really goes against all this. Yeah, yeah, um, presentation. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, the, the, clearly, 
that there's a place between extension and flexion. Um, you know, the, the, the problem with flexion, if you stay in it too long, is you inhibit your, rib, your, your yeah. breathing and your, your, your digestion. So th there's a place where you're not extending the holding on with the muscles and becoming stiff, and you're not stifling your digestion and your respiration, where you're supported by your sitting bones, by your spine, where your skeleton supports you. And when your skeleton supports you, of course, muscles can relax. You know, it's a, it's a truism that muscles can only relax when they're well supported. And you either use a chair as your support, which is very sensible, or you use your skeleton. So, you know, your feet need to be on the ground, you know, not raised off the ground. If, if you, people who lift their heels when they're sitting on a chair like this, you, you know, just try it. If you lift your heels off the ground, if you, if you just do that, you're using your hip flexors, yeah, yeah, you're using yeah. quadriceps, you're using calf muscles. There's a tension in that. So I have a question for yeah. you about both the flexion and the... What's the other one? Flexion and extension. Flexion. And feet. Yeah, yeah, I was watching because, your feet. I, because I actually do yeah. move my feet quite yeah, a lot. Yeah. They're pretty... I'm pretty... But I move... I, I mean, if I'm... Mm. I might lean from one side to another. And I, if I'm in movement and if I'm mm. moving between these flexion mm. and extension, if I'm moving between and not fixed in any of these mm. places, if I'm, is that how would you, is that, well, I, you, is I that guess okay, or should you think there should be a, I mean, a it, place? My, my, my answer is I, I really don't know because I'm, I'm not the cellist, but what, what I would ask you to explore is how much of that movement is necessary. Mm. You know, it, what you don't want to do is fix anything. Mm. That's absolutely yeah. true. I don't think you should be constraining anything. You shouldn't, mm. You know, I've got to hold my instrument still, or I've got to keep my spine still, or you know anything like that. But I think there's a value in saying, because you know, if you start moving too much, yeah, yeah. it's a it's a distraction. But there can be there can also be a sense. I mean, I think that what's interesting is there's a kind of inner movement. For example, I might mm. in an inner way, you know, just mm. if I'm fixed, if I've actually fixed my feet on the floor mm. in a certain way, then I'm not allowing that kind of inward. Sure, Flow. but I know I was talking about fixing. Um, you know, you support yourself on your feet. You, you rest your feet on the floor. You don't fix them. You rest them. So if I'm making a movement, my feet, my whole body's going to move, and that's going to end up in yeah. my feet, whatever yeah. I'm doing. But there's a resonance everywhere. Yeah, yeah. From, yeah. You know, that's all I mean. Yeah. Really, really, is if we cut off that yeah. possibility of it just being alive. Sure, sure. Yeah. And stiffness always does. Mm. You know, and. and those kind of ungrounding ourselves, you know, you talk, we talk about grounding a lot in yoga and I, I think it's an overused word in a way because it, it takes, if you use it too often, it, it's, people sort of, oh, I, I need to be grounded, but what does that really mean? Mm. It really means giving your weight to the floor through the skeleton. So if I'm sitting and I'm being grounded, I want to give my weight to the chair through my sitting bones. I want to sit down, I don't want to sit up. Mm. I'm going to rest my feet on the floor through my bones. So, so being grounded is stabilising yourself to the floor through your bones. But that, that's nothing to do with being um, stiff. You know, the, the other analogy I quite like is there are two ways of being quiet <coughs> or still. You can be still like a brick wall and nothing's going to happen there, you know, that's, mm. that's the stiffness. So you can be still like a, an unruffled pond, mm. um, which has a full potential for movement. Mm. And the kind of stillness we're always looking for in ourselves is the quiet pond, not mm. the brick wall. Mm. Anxiety and worry turn us into the brick wall, and then that stops us yeah. being able to function. Yeah, and, and also my experience is that it, with the, with that kind of grounding, there's a lightness, isn't there? Yeah. The upper body becomes it's light. Ease, and ease. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was thinking about we. There's going to be some questions. I think is it. No questions yet. There are no questions. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Come on, one. everybody. <laughs> Ask some questions. Okay. So yeah, that that. So that's something that I've. There's a kind of grounding that which which is heavy and stuck, um, and there's a grounding that's very alive and yeah. allows the upper body to be free and I, that's where I mean I'd really be interested in what you how do you mean want. say that first bit well yeah. there's a kind I found myself that there, there's a there can be a kind of grounding which only has a downward motion which pulls down and okay. we need buoyancy in our playing especially okay. I mean, for example if you take yeah. playing a bass line yeah 
Um, I remember working with a conductor called Emmanuel Hayim and she, she said something really beautiful. She said, this, you must never land until it's the time. You must never land the bass line. So the bass line is basically constantly being buoyant okay. for the upper voices yeah. until you land, which is the end of a cadence or whatever. And I suppose there's a kind of, I'm finding that there's a kind of groundedness which is pulled down and doesn't allow for a, for a buoyancy and a lightness. Mm. And there's a, different, there's a different kind of groundedness which is very alive and mm. uh, you can explain this I'm sure much better. But well, I might, I might not. Uh, it's a tension that I've uh, come across in yoga. You know, um, a tension in a, in a debate and an argument that exists, I think, in the yoga world. Um, sometimes, you know, my yoga I've, I've kind of navigated towards um, Someone's called post Caravelli in Evander's yeah, 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 yeah. work, and she always talked about the rebound yeah, effect. Yeah, exactly. Caravelli, rebound. I mean, and I've always been slightly concerned about the word, you know, because we aren't like a rubber ball. We don't rebound in that mm -hmm. sense, you know. Mm -hmm. If you put a, a glass of water on a floor, it doesn't bounce back up again. Mm -hmm. So, what do we really mean by that? You know, what do we mean by finding lightness by becoming grounded? And I do think it's this. I do think it's that when you are truly committed to the floor through a skeleton, and that is a down you, gravity is pulling us mm, down. Yeah. When we organise ourselves well in response to gravity, our muscles become very relaxed, and that's what creates the sense of lightness in us and the mm. freedom for our breathing. Mm. So if we're not, if you're not well, you know, if we're not committed to the floor through our skeleton, the only other way we've got to hold ourselves upright is with our muscles. So we stiffen, we become rigid, we become in parts of our body. You know, people do it, you know, I would classically do it around my neck and shoulders. That's why I would go in front of those tents. But people can clench their feet, their buttocks, their jaw. That's the only other possibility. See, there's no other way of staying upright as a human being than tensing muscles if you're not using your skeleton. So I, I suspect that what, what's really going on here is that when people really organise themselves in the gravity field, muscles relax enough that you have this sense of physical lightness that feels like buoyancy, and that's the way we mm. describe it. But I don't, you know, there's nothing actually pushing us up, mm. I don't think. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and, and yet we are making movements like sure. a bouncing ball we make movements like this all the time yeah. so that if i if i have a stroke a bow stroke and i want and it's like so i'm if i haven't got that release yeah if um then i'm going to pull my arm up instead yeah, of allowing yeah. it to so, be a response you know, to the down sure so, do you see what i mean well but it's the same isn't it tension anywhere will make this a stiffer yeah, more yeah, yeah. more um you know, anyone, anyone who's even just bouncing a ball on the floor, you know, yeah. if you're doing that, if your whole body's involved in it, it's going to be a very different thing than if you're doing something it like that. It is amazing how much we can take those very simple movements and as soon as we put it on an instrument, we lose our entire capacity to make that okay. natural movement. Yeah. It's incredible. Right. Then you start so, holding bits yeah, of your body. Yeah, pull it up. And, yeah. I mean, especially, yeah. for example, I'll give you an example of if you're playing in an orchestra and you're being yeah. constantly told to play quietly. Yeah. So you're more and more, one has the tendency to lift the weight yeah. away from the instrument yeah. by stiffening, yeah. Yeah. instead yeah, of redistributing it. And mm. I mean, to me, there's, yeah. it's just about redistribution, yeah. but, and that is a release. But this is yeah. a stiffening, and, and many people, I mean, I know for myself playing years and years in orchestra of, of being told, be quiet, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, it's yeah. amazing, especially yeah, yeah. the cellos. Yeah. Um, uh, is is the tendency is to really lift and even just in the minutest way to lift yeah. away from the yeah. string, lift away from the instrument. Well, to lift up against away. gravity. Oh, against you, gravity. Yeah, yeah. And you do it when you're driving. You know, people yeah. do you drive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that's very true. I mean, the any kind of worry or anxiety makes us pull up. Um, you know, if you. If you pick up an anxious child, it's nearly always an extension. It's stiff. It's, mm. it's that way. If it's if, it's, if if you pick up a child that's being comforted and, and you know happy to see you, it will kind of fold and flex into you. So there are these two kind of ways we respond to the world by stiffening and becoming rigid, or softening and, and mellowing. Mm. It's a slightly more nuanced 
argument in that because we can collapse under pressure too. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the situation where you are intent playing in front of an audience. But um, our tendency much more is to is to the kind of fright response, mm. the anxiety, the stiffening of anxiety. Yeah. So looking for support seems fundamental in our battle against yeah. that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we have a few questions. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Angela from New Jersey uh, asked to please discuss uh, mindfulness in relation to practicing. Uh -huh. uh, then Desmond uh, is interested in thoughts around creating and releasing of tension in the body in alignment to a musical choice. Um, uh, Simone, uh, could you speak about the concepts of opposition in maintaining balance and the difference between holding balance and renewing balance? And um, and lastly, uh, someone is interested in the balance between performance mode as a professional, uh, as a professional musician, whilst being able to maintain awareness uh, of self mm. simultaneously. Wow, there's a lot in there. There's, there's a lot quite in a there. bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why um, should we take them one by one? That last one we could. Okay. Go, I mean, go that, I just find the last question an interesting one. Um, Can you repeat that last question? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm interested in the balance between performance mode as a music, as a professional musician, whilst yeah being able to maintain awareness of self mm. simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak as a musician because I'm not one, but I, you know, I speak in front of people quite a lot. So in, in that sense, I, I perform. And as I say, I've had a fledgling cricket career and things mm. like that. But, um, you know, I do think that the practice of being a performer, and I'm, I'm being quite careful how I'm saying this because I, I'm thinking about all the different kinds of ways you perform, but as a musician, there is no need, I think, to take your body to an extreme. I'm, I'm thinking about ballet or something like that, where people might hurt themselves in order to look beautiful. You know, they're, they're putting on performance and they, they want to present themselves, and that's the whole point of, of, of ballet and dance, is to look beautiful for the audience. And I think in those circumstances, now, I, it's possible that you, you might have to take your body into places that you might not normally do. And then mm. the, the, there, is a, there is a tension between that kind of performing and the awareness of how comfortable you are. Although, of course, you can always say that even if you have to do something really difficult and you, it, the movement you have to make is a really hard one for the body, there are ways of making it harder and ways mm. of making it easier. And you're always looking for the... the you know, the, the way to, to take even difficult things as easy as possible. So you know, it's why it's the only reason I teach head balance is because it's a it's a difficult thing to organise your body around. You know, you could, could say in a performative way, it's a performance really. But because it's difficult, you have to pay the kind that you have to pay really acute attention to how you feel. Otherwise, you can hurt yourself. You know, and I'm sure that's true of other performances uh, of dance. It, with, with musicians, because you, I, I don't imagine you have to make those hugely expansive movements in a way, but you may have to hold an instrument for a long period of time. You, know, you may have to be holding an instrument for hours, I'm not sure. But the, the, the point again would be to, as you practice pieces, to be as interested in the economy of your movements and the, you know, the tension here and it's a question I asked you right at the beginning do you feel and I, I think this is probably an interesting question because I'm, I'm coming to a kind of answer in my head myself do you have to be a performer you know, mm, do you have I, to be out there I don't, and I, I really yeah, doubt this you yeah, see I, I really doubt this I think the more you are in yourself the more in touch you are with your own sensory experience, your own breath, your own sense of release mm. in your body, the more powerfully any performance will come through. I agree, through. and I think that goes to the other question about mindfulness, and yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, and that really is something that is, um, goes against a lot of what we learn, because we yeah. learn that we have to make an interpretation, we have to present yeah. something, we, yeah. and I, I think the, the process of going inward first and that means listening in to our bodies, listening mm. in to our, really listening globally to yeah. the room, yeah. to 
but really starting mm. from here and I think what happens when we're not being mindful so this is what mindfulness really means to me is actually not losing oneself not losing yeah. oneself in the present moment yeah. and we do we give ourselves away actually and yeah. I had I just wanted to mention that mm. I just remembered a beautiful experience a long long time ago but really marked me uh, and makes more and more sense as um, as I go on. I uh, was with uh, the conductor Nicholas Hanonkorn and Chamber Orchestra of Europe. We were playing Haydn symphonies. And I'll never forget this. It was a really strong sensation that when we played, I don't know, I was cello number four or something, that, that the principal oboe or the fourth double bass and the person in the last row of the audience mm. and the conductor and the back of the second we mm. were all absolutely part of this moment right, yeah. we were all co-creating this moment right, right, and yeah. totally. there was a beautiful kind of humility in this mm. and that was not a performance that's yeah. the first time i ever experienced something that was not a performance mm. it was a really it was a being together in yeah, the moment being connected to that but we can't do that if we're not con connected no. to ourselves and that no, really nice starts with the body yeah. doesn't it mm. i mean if we're not in our bodies then yeah. we, we just can't begin to be in the present i don't think i mean you may no, no, argue I that but I, I, I completely agree and you know i think many of us have probably experienced times in our lives where you felt absolutely connected it might just be a walk in nature mm. so suddenly everything's dropped into place and you feel just part of of, of nature mm. or an intimate conversation with a friend where you you, you are just the, all the all the defenses are gone and mm. you're, you're open you're very porous mm. to, to yeah, each other yeah. and i think that these are these are things we we get closer to the less we are defended right and so when point. we're performing we mm. the performance even the word because like you often mention mm. it in yoga and mm. i always go mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because um, for me, that mm. performance is a very odd word. I don't yeah. even know what it means. I, yeah. I think more and more, and you won't go to a pub and you hear, you know, you hear sessions in mm. a pub in Scotland. That's not a performance, is it? No. And so I think I'm more and more interested in in uh, in 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 music in mm. being more in that kind of sense of just being with, if that makes sense. Well, well I the way I think about performance is something you do for somebody else. Mm, right. So, you know, I, I could be, if I was trying to impress you, you know, yeah. I, I, in the way I put it, I would, in a sense, be performing for yeah. you. And, and I don't think that then we can have a, a proper conversation. I don't think we can... No. We can... They wouldn't trust you anyway. No, exactly. But that's <laughs> yeah, really I, true, isn't we it? We don't trust performance, you know, and you yeah. see it in politicians. And, and it's why I'm, I'm very... Um, this is a bit controversial too. I, I'm very sceptical of the you can fake it till you make it mm. kind of uh, mm. idea out there that you can power pose and become mm. powerful. Yeah. I think these are very unhelpful ways actually of, of approaching. It's like putting a sticking plaster over something. It's not really getting to the root of noticing how you are in a room. You know, I really like what you said there because you. Ultimately, you've got to be at ease in yourself in, a, in an environment. Mm, mm. So you, when you come into a room, you, you look around, you take it all in, so nothing's going to surprise mm. you. Mm. You know, you're aware of the, the, the kind of ambience in the room, you, the mm. people in it, the decor, you, 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 the, what you're sitting on, the floor. You know it. Mm. And, and in a sense, you want to become comfortable in that environment. Mm. And that takes time and yeah, yeah. um, another story of I went to a, a very famous cellist concert I won't mention who because particularly because I do really admire this person as a musician <laughs> but I was very shocked when he it was a zoomed onto the stage sat down and started playing like that and I actually I was I was really angry Right. I thought, hang on, you know, yeah. I don't feel in any way invited into this. Right. I didn't even feel he'd invited himself into it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happens if we, and this is what's, and <clears throat> going back to the question about mindfulness and practice, yeah. that we, pra we have to practice this. We yeah. can't just add it on sure. when we get, sit on stage. Yeah, sure. We have to practice this, so I have to practice. So I sit and I welcome myself yeah. and I take in the room mm. and, and I breathe. Mm. And that in itself is a way of, of mm. it's a sort of anti-performance. Well, you know what I mean? It's, 
it's the same and actually that, when you describe that just reminds me of the start of a yoga class you lie down on the floor mm -hmm. you turn your phones off you check all the environments okay mm -hmm. you, you know after the say we've got these extra receptors about organizing ourselves in the room eyes ears mm -hmm. smell you can and you've got proprioceptors and interoceptors and you listen to them all and until you feel as comfortable as you can in your environment yeah. and then you can start to do something but if there's an agitation still going on or if you haven't checked yeah. in you're going to be taking all that with you mm. so i love i love that what you just said then you know about just sitting waiting just pausing yeah and it doesn't take and... very much time but yeah. i think that this key for the audience i'm sure mm. the audience feels mm. okay so i'm part of this mm. we're in the, we're yeah. going together you know yeah. it's like taking somebody's hand well, it gives them time to wait yeah, and connect, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, but I again, mean, it really is, you know, yeah. that if we, that is something that we, yeah, you can't just plaster it on when you right. do a performance. Is there, um, was there another question? There were two more that, uh, uh, if so, we can. Uh, one was to discuss uh, mindfulness uh, in relation just, to yeah. practicing. I think we just covered uh, that, except I would add something about that, actually, and I, I think probably, Pete, you would agree, I hope you would, anyway. Mm. But, um, one of the things about this is the language we use with ourselves and yeah. I'll give you the example of intonation if I'm practicing and I if I'm practicing um, the, it's quite astonishing the level of judgment the way we speak to ourselves so if okay. I'm practicing yeah. and I play something out of tune mm. and I even if I don't do it in a in a, a, a negative so-called negative tone of voice but the information I give myself is it's out of tune right. there's no information in that no. in my body Right. Do I mm. do I prepare more? Was it flat or was it yeah. sharp? Mm. Do I prepare more or do I prepare less? All I've done is given myself a judgment, and that, mm. that to me is not mindful practicing. Mm. Mm. That is basically recreating a map. Yeah. That is there's yeah, there's nothing right. I can change in this. Yeah. I'm actually wh whatever message yeah. I've given myself. Yeah. So that is the that mindful practicing really is about all these questions we've been talking about. Am I comfortable? Mm what information is there that I can take notice of and mm. if we can do that in, in a, with kindness to ourselves and I think for me mm. just to the last thing on the mindfulness aspect is one of the biggest things about being mindful is just to be kind yeah. to oneself sure. you know yeah. that I mean it, it's um, yeah, and everyone else yeah and everyone else but first sure. so I hope that answers yeah. the question and there was another uh, is, could you speak about the concept of opposition in maintaining balance and the difference between holding balance and renewing balance? Mm. You want to start on that one? Oh, I'm trying to, trying to think what that means. Opposition between. Maybe I can give you an example okay. of if I'm if I'm taking the bow out, bow out here. Mm. I'll have a sense of my. I think this is what this means. I'll have a real sense of my left side. This okay. sort of diagonal, yeah. this kind of uh, opposition of movement. So, uh -huh. so that my left side and my right side have this lovely diagonal kind of tension. Okay. That when my arm releases mm. back, it's mm. so in a way. Well, you, there's you, a, always a kind of opposition. If I'm going over yeah. here, something I'll else leave there, there, and then I'll be. So I'm always yeah. kind of crisscrossing in movement. Yeah. I think. And that's maybe what the question means, but well, it it, if it does, you know, it's, you know, we do this thing in yoga where I sometimes just say, let your hands slide. Yeah, down. yeah. You know, and if you let your hands slide down your thigh, um, what I'm interested in is does the rest of the body go in the other direction? Because if it doesn't, you, you, you're going to create tension and stiffness in the body. Mm. So any time you take yourself out of the gravity field, whether I'm leaning backwards, my hips have to go forwards. Mm. Whether I'm leaning right. forwards, my hip has to go backwards. I'm leaning to the left, my hips up here to the right. So whatever, balance is always about allowing your body to compensate for your movement away from the gravity line. And, you know, partly because I think people, I don't know what it's like in your world, but in the yoga world, there was a long time we were told not to move the pelvis. You know? yeah. And that just completely binds you up. Us too. And, 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 Instead of saying, well, the pelvis has, you know, if I'm going this way, the pelvis has to move that way. Yeah. If I'm going this way, the pelvis has to move that That's the only way I'm going to keep my body in a, in any sense of equilibrium yeah. that's Which, going to reduce yeah. tension. So that would make sense if I'm, mm. you know, if I'm anchoring mm. through my left sitting bone, if I'm out here, mm. 
I'm not going to pull the whole body over to them. No, right? you fall off, wouldn't you? Because I've lost my <laughs> yeah. balance. So what I really need, and I really, I do have a sense of anchoring yeah. in through the left foot and the left sitting yeah. bone in order for that to, yeah. and that will be constantly changing. So I'll be, you know, yeah. in some sense, I'll be leading yeah. with, so I'll be, I'll maybe lean into this side in order to go out there, and then I'll lean back to there. In order, so then, because that, that's yeah. this constant spiral in effect. Yeah. With well, maintaining again, balance. One of the things I started doing in yoga in the last couple of years, it's a bit more than that, and you always realise these years are stretched out through the pandemic, but you know, we, we used to teach in yoga a very classic thing or something like this, I mean, everyone would have to be really quite still, you know. <laughs> now I'm, I'm much more interested in bringing your foot off the floor and then and looking around, moving, upsetting your balance, because what you're interested in is, does your body know how to compensate for its you know, it's moving away from the gravity line. Is your body free enough and, and uh, loose enough that it can compensate for any movement away from the gravity line? That's a much more useful skill than trying to be, you know, like mm. a tree, mm. it, or it, it, in that sense. And I think if you've got a, a job where you're moving all the time, inevitably you're going to be asking questions of your body that around that thing. Yeah. And I can I allow my body to compensate. My arms are going that way. Can my body go the other way? So yeah. you, you don't stiffen. Yeah. yeah. I hope that. I hope I that's that the, the, what the question was about. Who was the question from? Oh, there was another one. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, Simone. Simone. All right. Um, yeah. That's cool. it. That's it. Good. Okay. Great. Well, it's well, very nice to see you, Pete. Very nice to see you, Ruth. <laughs> and uh, that brought out some interesting questions. Yeah, right? it's and really lovely. Yeah. Lovely, great. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing you at the yoga class next. Oh, well, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> you can come to my cello workshop if you like. Well, oh, yes, yeah. I should mention, actually, that um, Jane Fenton, who is a, a cellist, but yeah. also trained... I mention this because she trained to be a yoga teacher with Pete. Yeah, yeah, she did. And she's a wonderful cellist, and she and I are giving a workshop on Tuesday in London. If you're so about. Okay. <laughs> I think Jane is there. Hi, Jane. Um, so if anybody's interested in exploring these further with their own instruments and their own bodies, mm. well, that would be lovely to see you. And I'm sure that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. So. Good. Well, right. let's go have a drink then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>